بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين For the hastening of the reappearance of the Master, the Savior, the Avenger, Al Hujjat ibn al Hasan al Askari recite the loudest of salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. My dear brothers and sisters, elders, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One of the most important factors that allows life to flourish and progress and to be productive is hope. Because to be deprived of hope is to be deprived of your most important capital in this life. We recite in Dua Kumail. Ya man, O oh Allah, we address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, irham man ra'su malihil raja' wa silahuhu al-buka' Ra'su al-mal means your capital. It means your most important asset with which you can build a thriving business. Imagine if a businessman Someone who's an entrepreneur suddenly loses everything they have. What's that state of mind called? Bankruptcy, except in this case, we're talking about emotional and spiritual bankruptcy. Not having any hope for the future. Being despondent. Being in a state of despair. Which once again means that you are deprived of hope. Our traditions tell us that without hope, no mother would nurse her child. Think about it. The only reason a mother endures the trials, the difficulties, the challenges of being a mother, which is one of the single most difficult roles a person can play in this life. The only reason she does that is because she has hope for the future. She has hope that this child will grow into a healthy adult and will continue her legacy. That through this child she'll be able to contribute towards the betterment of society and to seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without hope, a mother has no reason to wake up multiple times in the middle of the night to be deprived of her comfort and sleep to nurse this child. The hadith also then continues to say that without hope, no farmer would plant a tree. Why would you? Unless you have hope that this is going to grow into something in the future. And the hadith also tells us by the commander of the faithful, The worst affliction is to be deprived of hope. Again, many people go through challenges that eat away at their sense of hope. 
And that is one of the worst conditions to be in. As I said, it leads to the individual becoming dysfunctional, being depressed, being despondent, and society unable to thrive and progress and grow once hope is severed. There are certain countries, entire nations, where you feel that there is a sense of despondency. When you speak to people, they're always complaining. When you engage with the general public, whether it be the barber or the taxi driver or the any number of professions, you feel that they have no hope. And because of that, it turns into a self-fulfilling prophecy. That the way they, they describe their nation and the stagnation and the political upheaval is one that they end up contributing towards because of their hopelessness, because of their despondency. And so, أَعْظَمُ الْبَلَاءِ إِنْقِطَاعُ الرَّجَاءِ As the Imam says, القنوت قاتل صاحبه Amir al-Mu'mineen also says, by the way, the difference between قنوت and yes, which are two words that describe the state of hopelessness and despondency, they've both been used in the Holy Quran. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wala taqnatu. And sometimes He says, Wala tayasu. Now, even though these two words are synonymous, but they are different. Because in one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them both together. So clearly, there's a difference between these two, despite being synonymous. And the difference lies in the fact that qunut is to experience hopelessness in your heart. Whereas yes is for that hopelessness to transpire and manifest itself in your actions. It is when you become depressed. It is when you feel that life is completely aimless and useless. It is the moment when you experience that sense of stagnation. So. This is a very important subject that the Qur'an talks about, the Ahlul Bayt have spoken about, and as we shall demonstrate, the mistress of the women of the world, Fatima al Zahra, alayha salatu was salam, Allahumma salli ala has addressed through her conduct and her actions. Fatima is the epitome of hope. Fatima is the greatest inspiration for looking forward to a bright future. And through her inspiration, inshallah, I aim to address this most important of subjects. Because I encounter many people as part of my work, what I do, people feel that they can confide in me. They can turn to me for advice for better or for worse, but people have this look and perception of people that are in my position. And because of that, I encounter so many issues, so many problems and challenges. And one common theme, one consistent thread between most of those who approach me for advice and counsel is that either they have lost hope because of the afflictions and the tribulations that they've been through, or they're on the verge of losing hope. And so part of what I have to do is to try and not just address the root cause of their problems, but also give them inspiration so that they could restore some of that hope without which their lives would be completely ruined. And it can lead to all manner of mental health issues, families breaking apart, and the individual even going as far as to consider suicide and other drastic measures. May Allah protect us all from them. So let's look at some of the causes of hopelessness. What is it that pushes people into this detrimental and dangerous state of mind. And I am sure that you can relate to at least one or two 
of these root causes. And hopefully we'll try and address them and then finally deduct and try and extrapolate inspiration from the life of Fatima to Zahra. The first cause of despondency and hopelessness is this idea that I have been praying but my prayers are not answered. How many times have you encountered people or have you yourself thought to yourself that I prayed for such and such but it didn't work out. Immediately after this thought, people begin to slip into despondency and hopelessness. Because if my prayer wasn't answered, then what's the point? What's the point of dua? What's the point of turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And you can begin to see those cracks appearing in the dam. And all it takes for a dam to come crumbling down and bringing about absolute destruction is one crack. And so this is a very common cause of hopelessness. I've been praying, but I didn't get what I asked for. The problem is that, is that we have an erroneous understanding of dua to begin with. What is dua at its very essence? Does dua equate to or automatically lead to our wishes being granted? Or is dua something else? Dua at its essence, my dear brothers and sisters, is to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mere fact that we have been blessed and honored and given the opportunity to turn to Allah, to speak to Him, to address Him, is in itself something that requires a great deal of tawfiq and divine backing. The fact that we're able to address Him as we read in multiple devotional texts, in supplications attributed to Imam Zain al-Abideen and the 12th Imam and others, Allahumma sallam. We say, oh Allah, had you not given me the permission to address you, I would have exalted you from my remembrance. You are too lofty, you are too great for me to even roll your blessed name down my tongue. And it's only because you encouraged me to call on to you. You blessed me and gave me this honor and permission to speak to you that I am able to raise my hands toward you. Dua is an honor in and of itself. Dua is an act of worship. Dua is just like prayer and fasting and hajj and others. You should enter into it with no expectations other than the fact that you are now in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it's a mistake. It is an erroneous idea that we've been fed that the minute I raise my hands and I ask God for a favor that somehow He is obligated to give me what I've asked Him, to grant my wish. That's point number one. Point number two, someone by the name of Al-Bazanti, who was a close companion of our sixth Imam, Ja'far ibn Muhammad al sadiq alayhi salatu was salam. He once went to see his master, the Imam, and he was in a state of despair and hopelessness. He said to him, Yabna Rasulullah, O son of the Messenger of God, I've been praying for this thing for three years. Imagine a prayer that lasts this entire time, but nothing's happened. I haven't been granted my wish. The Imam said to him, Ya Bazanti, if I promise to do something for you down the line, whether it's tomorrow or next week or next month, but I promised you, I gave you my word that I will deliver. Would you not believe me? He said, of course I, I believe you. You are the messenger of, you're the son of the messenger of God. Absolutely, I would believe you. He said to him, Ya Bazanti, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you. He has given you a promise in his holy book when he said, Ud'uni astajib lakum. Call on to me. I shall answer you. He has given you a promise. Now, 
if this promise is delayed, if the fulfillment of God's promise is delayed, if it doesn't happen now or next month or next year, you know for a fact that it will happen. He is after all the creator of the universe. And so, one thing we should always remember when it comes to the concept of dua is that the promise has been made. However, as one of our ulama has said, if you don't receive the wish that you have asked, that specific item that you have prayed for, it means either you have faltered when it comes to ud'u or when it comes to the dhamir ni. Ud'u ni. Allah is saying, call unto me. Have you really called out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The call that you have made, was it sincere? And by sincere, I don't mean, did you really mean to get what you wanted? What I mean is, when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, did you ask Him to test things out, to see whether the dua works or not? Or did you expect Him to deliver? Did you put your trust in Him? Did you expect nothing but good from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as our traditions tell us? Our hadith say that when you make a dua, expect the answer to your prayer to be at your doorstep. Meaning don't ask in a half-hearted manner. Don't ask thinking, oh, maybe it's going to work out, maybe it won't work out. Ask knowing that Allah is powerful enough to deliver no matter what. So call on to Him with sincerity, with the highest of expectations. Put your trust in Him. Number two, call on to Him and no other person. Meaning that if you have hope that it's the doctor who is going to cure your loved one, if your hope is in the medical system, as good and as beneficial as it happens to be. But if your hope is divided between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the means with which we normally and ordinarily satisfy our needs, then there is a problem there. Let me give you a small illustration. If you have your wallet in your pocket, you have your credit card, you have some cash, you have your car keys. You'd leave the house confident because what's the worst that can happen? If you need money, the credit card's there. If the credit card fails for whatever reason, you have some cash to spare. You have your car keys, you can always get in and drive. You don't have fuel, you can buy it. We usually feel a sense of comfort and confidence when the means with which we satisfy our needs are available to us. But imagine you're out there, suddenly you notice that your wallet is missing, especially if you're traveling and you're in a foreign land. You don't know the language, you don't know the locals, you don't have any friends or acquaintances. You suddenly notice that your passport's missing, your wallet's missing, your credit card, your cash, all these things are gone, we panic. Why do we panic? Because the things that normally satisfy our needs are gone. You begin to think, how, how will I get back? How will I have food today? How will I do this? How will I do that? Your trust should be in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God is ultimately the one who satisfies your needs. These are mere tools. These are things that in the material realm, we use them to satisfy those needs. And we've been raised that way. We have been uh, conditioned to trust the means as opposed to the ultimate source of healing and comfort, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've been conditioned that if you have a headache, how do you relieve the headache? You take a pill. If you get sick, you go to the doctor. But what happens is that every once in a while, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pushes you into a corner, deprives you of these needs, makes you completely on your own, and then tests your faith. 
which is why he then says وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ Whoever maintains piety and guards against sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test them. He will push you into that corner. He will put you between a rock and a hard place as they say. But if you maintain that faith and piety, Allah will then provide for you from sources that you didn't expect. In other words, He will satisfy your needs, but not through the credit card. Generally speaking, people are comfortable when they have a steady income, don't they? When they have a job and they receive some kind of a wage or salary, suddenly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does something where you get fired from your job and you get sick and suddenly you have a debt to pay and, and all of these things pile up on you to test you. If you pass the test, if you maintain piety, meaning you don't resort to illicit means and haram ways of satisfying these desires and needs. If you maintain that piety, suddenly God will surprise you. He will provide for you, not from your job, but from the most unexpected of sources. He will find a way out for you. And He will sustain you and provide you from sources you least expected. Suddenly money comes from some kind of inheritance. Suddenly the healing from the sickness comes not from the medicine, but from a miracle. And He makes sure that you acknowledge the miracle. He makes sure that you realize that this didn't happen because of the medicine or the doctor or the healer or whatever it is, but that God made it so. So, when prayers are not answered, maybe, just maybe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has something else in store for you. Maybe Allah is replacing those prayers and compensating them with the most valuable of currencies, which is thawab. Thawab is the most valuable currency on Judgment Day. It is through thawab that you can ascend in the levels of paradise. It is through thawab that you can avoid falling into the bottomless, abysmal hell. It is through thawab that people are Rewarded or punished on the day of judgment. Now imagine you're told that for every dua that you make, while you may not get that shiny little thing that you so hope you could get, instead we will credit bitcoins into your account. Would anybody say no? Would anybody say, no, no, I still want that little thing? Allah is saying that every time you make dua, you are being credited with something. Either it is thawab or it is, and these are found in our ahadith by the way, I'm not coming up with this from my own pocket. Or through this dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may not give you that fast supercar that you're asking for, but He may repel evil and affliction from your life. Maybe through this dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is redirecting your prayers into areas in your life that are more meaningful and more important and more impactful in the long run. Maybe the dua, instead of going towards getting that thing that you want, is going towards making sure that your children grow up healthy and more importantly, they grow up with a sense of spirituality and proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that not a greater blessing than all of the material possessions in this world? Absolutely it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you something. And also don't forget the fact that sometimes the things that we ask for are not in our best interest. They're just not. I'll give you one tiny example. Somebody wants a boy. And this is common in many families irrespective of culture. I'm not singling out any particular culture or country or ethnicity. There is this obsession with having boys. When in fact, if you look at the traditions of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, it is girls that are praised. 
It is having girls and daughters that is given such an incredible position in the eyes of God and His messengers. But we have this obsession. I want a boy, I want a boy. And when we don't get that boy, we become hopeless, we become despondent. What's going to happen to my lineage? As though this girl is not a vehicle for creating a lineage as well. We have traditions that, remember in the story of, subhanAllah, this just came to my mind. The famous story of Prophet Musa and Al-Khidr. The incident where that young boy was killed by Al-Khidr alayhi salam. Musa being the normal human being that he was, someone endowed with the intellect and human emotions, objected to what Khidr did. Long story short, the bit that I want to focus on is this. Imam al-Sadiq says that when that boy was killed, of course later on Musa found out that this boy was going to grow up being a source of misery for his parents. He would have hurt his parents. Perhaps he would have been a disbeliever, an evildoer, a tyrant, who knows. So he was killed. Number one, the boy ended up dying in his youth and innocence, which means that he was stopped from committing those evil acts. So this was in the best interest of the boy. And as for the parents, it was in their best interest because they were spared a life of misery and trouble. But even greater than all of that, Imam al-Sadiq says that these two parents, because of their patience, because of their faith, because of putting their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God replaced the boy with a girl. And from the lineage of that girl, Allah sent 70 prophets. Now think about it. Put yourself in the position of those, of those two poor parents who just lost their boy. In fact, their boy didn't die of natural causes. He was killed. But because they put their trust in God and none other, because they believed in this primordial concept that the Holy Prophet and also Amir al-Mu'mineen elucidate in the most beautiful and articulate fashion, I'm amazed at the affairs of a believer, how they always turn out in their best interest. The hadith says, I'm amazed. The Imam, Amir al muminin who's seen it all. The one who said, That Amir al muminin says, I am shocked and amazed that it always turns out in their best interest. Because at first it doesn't seem like it. At first you feel like this is the end of the world. People become despondent. People become hopeless. But if you maintain that hope and know that while maintaining your faith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look after you. He's got something in store for you. It doesn't make sense at the beginning, but later, 10, 20, 30 years down the line, you look back and you realize how Allah was the most merciful of those who are merciful. So maybe Allah has got something else in store and He wants to give you that because of your prayers. Because prayers are a sign of tawakkul. They're a sign of putting your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this idea that I prayed but things didn't work out, I didn't get what I wanted, who knows what would have happened and would have transpired had you been granted that wish. Maybe people, for example, sometimes you see a couple and it's truly painful. I'm not trivializing this whatsoever. But sometimes you come across individuals who are trying for a child for 2, 3, 5, 10, 15 years, but they don't end up having any children. I wouldn't wish this on anyone. As I said, it's extremely painful. However, we don't know what would happen if they did have a child. How would you know? This life, brothers and sisters, is a very intricate, a set of intricate 
and interconnected laws. You change one part of it, it may lead to what's called the butterfly effect, where one tiny thing here changes, but then massive ramifications take place down the line, elsewhere in your life. We don't know. Maybe if your wife got pregnant and she was about to have that child, that her body didn't have the capacity for it. Maybe she would die as a result of that pregnancy or during childbirth. She dies and then you end up with this child. And then it's a life of misery and difficulty. Who knows is my point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees the whole picture. Whereas you and I, we're only looking through a tiny keyhole. We're not seeing the bigger picture. We're only seeing my own needs, my own desires. But Allah is seeing what is in my best interest, if I'm a believer. So that's one of the root causes of hopelessness. But once you recalibrate your view, once you begin to understand and appreciate what dua really is and what it's supposed to do, and you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Next time when you pray and your wish isn't granted, you don't automatically feel hopeless. Rather, you maintain your hope and your hope keeps growing the more you pray because you know that this prayer is not going to waste. That this prayer is getting you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The famous story of Abu Dhar who was praying all night long for days and nights and eventually Jibra'il descended upon the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. And he said to him, O Messenger of God, do you know why we're not giving Abu Dhar his wish that he's been praying so desperately for all this time? It's because the angels love to hear the voice of Abu Dhar's invocations. They love to hear his voice, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the status of Abu Dhar to increase. He wants Abu Dhar to be Abu Dhar, as opposed to just someone who prayed once and got his wish granted. And that was the end of the story. Rather, Abu Bakr became this towering giant in history because of his devotion, because of his prayers, and because of his proximity to Allah and his prophet and his family. So that's one cause. The other cause is when someone commits a grave sin. This is a satanic form of hopelessness. When a sin is committed, oftentimes sins are connected with each other. One small sin increases our audacity and shamelessness to commit yet another and another and another. I've said this before, no serial killer is born as a serial killer. No maniacal despot or tyrant is born as a despot. It's tiny little steps that lead these individuals into a life of wickedness and misery. The same is true of any other great sin. So what happens, as the hadith says, and I'm paraphrasing, in the sayyat, we should always seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, brothers and sisters. Traditions tell us that whenever you're confronted with a sin, uh, you should say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Meaning, Oh Allah, I am weak and I'm vulnerable and I'm prone to committing sin. But you should help me. You should step in to avert my path from this particular transgression. The hadith says, "Inna sayyat kullun akhidun bi'unuq al-akhir." Every sin is like a ring in the chain. You pull one, you think it's one, but you're pulling the entire chain. Every sin eats away at our faith and even the love of the Ahlul Bayt. I say this especially to younger members of the audience, those watching, you're still pure. You have pristine spirits and souls. Don't contaminate those spirits with acts of sin, no matter how seemingly small. Because 
the last thing the last thing you want is for this sin to take away from your love to the Ahlul Bayt, your love to Amirul Mu'mineen, your love to Fatima to Zahra in proportion to the sin. The Quran and traditions of the Ahlul Bayt are clear on this. That it is sins that could eventually take away the love of the Ahlul Bayt from our hearts. ثُمَّ كَانَ عَاقِبَةَ الَّذِينَ أَسَاءُوا السُّوءَ أَنْ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَكَانُوا بِهَا يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ I have seen this brothers and sisters with my own two eyes. I've encountered people who were good, who were sincere. They prayed, they fasted, they went to Hajj, they went to Ziyara. And I've mentioned some of these stories in my previous lectures. I don't want to get into it, but I've seen this. And then two, three, four years down the line, you suddenly hear this person is now an atheist. This person's abandoned all faith. What happened? But then when you examine their lives, when you actually go through the main stations that they've been through, you realize that it started with a small sin, which only grew and grew and grew, like a fire, like a flame. Imagine lighting a match and throwing it here on the carpet. It doesn't matter that the match is small, that the flame is tiny. The hadith says there are things, the small amount of which is just as dangerous as the big amount of those things. One of them is fire. A tiny flame can bring this entire building down, can raise it to the ground. Sins are the same. Make sure you don't do things that would eat away at your love toward the Ahlul Bayt, because that is our most important capital, isn't it? To be in connection to the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, the Holy Prophet and his family. That's what's going to save us on Judgment Day. Our deeds are all over the place, our actions are all over the place, but that's the one true, sincere thing that we have in our hearts. That's not a lie. We're not pretending, we're not being hypocrites about the love we have towards Fatima, are we? Maybe when it comes to our prayers, maybe when it comes to our other actions, that there might be flaws and issues, but that love is genuine. Let's not destroy it. So, sometimes a sin is committed and it completely destroys our faith in God. I'll give you a small example and move on. There's a man by the name of Humaid ibn Qahtaba. He was a military commander in the early Abbasid dynasty. One day, one of his friends says that I went to see him. It just so happened that it was the month of Ramadan. And I went to his house. When I sat down, he brought a, a bucket of water. He said, wash your hands. So I washed my hand. Then they put a tablecloth in front of us. They served food. And we started eating when all of a sudden I remembered it's the month of Ramadan. What am I doing? So he said to him, my master, again, he was a military commander who later became the governor of Khurasan, which was one of the most important provinces in the Abbasid dynasty. Basically all of Iran. So he was very respectful. He said to him, Sayyidi, maybe you happen to be ill. You have an excuse and that's why you're eating. But I'm not sick. I'm not traveling. I don't have an excuse. I can't eat. So Humayd ibn Qahtaba said to him, No, I'm not sick. I'm not traveling. I have no excuse. I'm just eating. I don't care about fasting. He said, But why? People will see you and they'll say, Look at this military commander in the government of Harun. And you're eating in broad daylight in the month of Ramadan. This looks bad. He said, look, let me tell you a story. One night, Harun sent for me. So I went to his palace. I entered. I saw him sitting down. There was a sword in front of him. And that terrified me. I thought, what is he trying to do? So he said to me, Ya Humayd, كيف طاعتك لنا? How obedient are you to me? He said, so I told him, I am obedient to the point 
of offering my own life for you. He said, okay, you can go now. So I went home. As soon as I entered my house, the messenger came back and he said to me, Harun wants you back. So I ran back to Harun. I entered. He was sitting down. Harun said to me, Ya Humaid, kayfa ta'atuka lana? How obedient are you? In other words, it's not enough that you're obedient to the point of death. He said, so being terrified, I said to him, I am obedient to you to the point of sacrificing my own life and the life of my wife and children. So he smiled and said, now you can go back home. As soon as I went back home, he sent after me again. I came back, he said to me, how obedient are you? I realized he wants more than that. So I said, I am obedient to you to the point of sacrificing my life and the life of my wife and children and my religion. I'm happy to step over my religion for you. He said at that point, Harun laughed. He said, if that's the case, then go with this guard and do what he tells you to do. It was in the middle of the night. I went with the guard. The guard took me to these prison cells. He opened one. I looked inside and there were 20 men from the descendants of Ali and Fatima, old and young. He said, now you have to kill them. Having already given my pledge, my allegiance, my loyalty, my religion, everything to Harun, I took the sword and I began to decapitate them one after the other. When I finished, he said, now come to this cell. He opened the cell, I looked inside, there were another 20 descendants of Fatima to Zahra Alawiyin. So I took the sword and I started to kill them one after the other. Then he opened the third cell and there were another 20. I started to kill them until the last person who was an elderly man, white beard, he looked at me. He said to me, how will you face my grandfather Rasulullah on the day of judgment, having killed 60 of his descendants? He said, when he said those words to me, فَرْتَعَدَتْ فَرَائِصِي I began to tremble and shake. But then I had no choice. I took the sword, I cut his head off. Then we took the bodies and the severed heads and we threw them down a well. Then Humayd ibn Qahtaba said to his friend, he said, I killed 60 Alawis in one night. This fasting, these prayers, these supplications, Islam won't do me any good. I'm going into the fires of hell. This, brothers and sisters, this sense of hopelessness and despair is incredibly demonic, incredibly dangerous. Because then you will stop at nothing. Once you feel like you've reached the end of the road, that you have no hope in God's mercy, this is in itself the greatest sin. One of the greatest sins is Al-Qunut min Rahmatillah. Ibn Muljam, may Allah's eternal damnations be upon him, when he was brought to Amir al muminin as the Imam was on his deathbed, the Imam opened his eyes. He looked at him, he said, Was I such a bad imam for you? What did I do to you? You were a slave. The imam didn't say these things, but we know he was a slave. The imam purchased him. The imam then freed him. The imam gave him money. The imam made him self-sufficient. What did I do for you to come and kill me in the state of salah, in my mihrab? What did Ibn Muljab say to the Imam? He said to him, Awa anta munqidhu man finnar ya Ali. Ali, are you trying to save someone who's already burning in the fires of hell? It is that despair and despondency from the mercy of God that made Ibn Muljam Ibn Muljam. It made him commit this unspeakable crime against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one of the causes of hopelessness is sin. The other cause of hopelessness, and I apologize for taking your time, but these are important discussions and they're very practical issues that we go through in our lives. The other thing is aimlessness. It is feeling that this life has no purpose. Why did we come into this world? Why did God create us? 
You've heard some people say these things. Well, what we may not know is the purpose for our creation. However, what we do know is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Einstein says, doesn't play dice. Allah who created this incredibly beautiful ecosystem, this world where every single infinitesimal part is so well designed and well crafted to achieve a specific purpose, surely Allah has a purpose for me. I may not know what that is, but Allah Himself says in the Holy Quran, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا Do you perceive that we have created you without a purpose, without an aim? Of course not. A child may not know why he needs to brush his teeth. Doesn't really get it. But a child knows that his parents care for him. He's seen signs of their kindness and their love to him. And so he just follows along. A child may not understand why he needs to wake up early in the morning and go to school. But at the end of the day, knowing that his parents love him or her, should, have, should do that because he knows that ultimately it's in his or her best interest. This sense of aimlessness is dangerous, brothers and sisters, because it leads to despair and hopelessness. The other cause of hopelessness is this idea that we compare ourselves to others. Haven't you ever seen yourself in that position where you say to yourself, how come I'm going through all these problems but my neighbor isn't, but my cousin isn't. Sometimes you hear people say, why is it that non-believers are so happy, whereas the believers and Muslims are so miserable? First of all, who told you that's the case? Who said that the disbelievers are happy, that they have no problems? Every single person is tested. Every single person has their own issues, their own problems. But because, partly because of social media, because of Photoshop and because of these clips that are so carefully edited, we imagine that their lives are so much better than ours, that they have so much more joy and happiness in their lives than we do. But we know that's not true. We've seen how many of these so-called influencers and YouTubers who act as though their lives are filled with nothing but happiness and pleasure and joy end up committing suicide, end up stopping their uh, activities online because they, they reach a point where they realize this is not giving them the satisfaction that they need. And so, never compare yourself to other people. Others are tested, so are you. Maybe in different ways, but at the end of the day, you have things that are unique to you. We have traditions actually that say that believers, every believer has a feature that is unique to them. Some skill, some beautiful thing in their life that is unique to them and that others don't have. There is something, you have to just find it, you have to discover it and you have to take advantage of it. Some people say, why don't I look beautiful? Why don't I have the beauty that so-and-so has? At the end of the day, you might have other things like faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their beauty is the source of their misery. We have traditions that state, إِنَّ مَنْ عِبَادِ اللَّهِ there are servants of Allah that cannot flourish. They cannot be good unless they remain poor. If they become rich, they lose their way. If they feel that they're self-sufficient, suddenly they go off track. Like the case of that man who came to the Prophet. You must have heard the story. And said to him, Ya Rasulullah, look at me, I'm so miserable, I'm so poor, this can't be right, do something, make a prayer, you are wajih and Allah. So the Prophet said to him, listen, this is best for you to be able to meet your basic needs, but not more than that. But he insisted. So eventually the Prophet gave him a dirham, a single small silver coin. He took that dirham, he went outside. He bought a sheep with it. It was the price of a sheep. Then he took that sheep, he slaughtered it, he sold the meat. He ended up with five dirhams and suddenly business flourished. In a short amount of time, suddenly he became extremely wealthy. To the point where he used to attend prayer behind Rasulullah. Imagine you're told that there is a congregational salat where the leader is none other than the manifestation of God's mercy and compassion. 
And while he was eager to come and pray day after day, when he started to get rich, obviously business requires time and commitment and you have employees and you have all kinds of financial commitments. And so he started to slack off. He started to procrastinate. He started to show up late. Eventually he stopped showing up. He stopped coming to the masjid. Rasulullah came across him one day. He said to him, why don't you join us for salat? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm busy right now. I've got some customers. Let me finish this off. Then maybe I can come. So the Prophet said to him, in that case, give me back my dirham. He said, sure. What's a dirham? I've got a million stacked up in my bank account. Here's your dirham back. As soon as he gave it back, he started to lose money. He experienced loss after loss after loss until he lost the entire business and show, guess who showed up to Salah the next day? He came and the Prophet said to him, see, I told you, this is not in your best interest. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you that which is good for you. There were other factors I wanted to mention, but perhaps for another time. <laughs> How did Fatima to Zahra become the epitome of hope? First of all, by relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by putting her trust in God. Fatima to Zahra lived a life of austerity, a life, dare I say, of absolute poverty. At what point are you extremely poor? It's when you don't have food to put on the table. It's when you go to bed while hungry. Fatima to Zahra experienced that, especially in the early years of her marriage. And yet, it got to a point where Amir al muminin said to her, why don't you go to the Prophet and maybe ask him for some help? Maybe he could help you with a little bit of money or he could send someone, a servant or what have you, to help with the house chores. So Fatima to Zahra went to the Prophet. She asked him for help. The Prophet said to her, how about I teach you a dua instead? Imagine you go to your father for help and he says, I'll just pray for you. Most people would be offended and insulted. Fatima to Zahra said, absolutely, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Abata, teach me the dua. So the Prophet taught her this dua. Ya Rabbal Awaleen Wal Akhireen. O Lord of those who came early on and those who will come until the end of time. Ya Rabbal Awaleen Wal Akhireen. Ya Rahim al Masakin, Ya Arham al Rahimin. The Prophet said, Here's a dua that I have taught you instead of helping you put food on the table. Fatima to Zahra went back home. She entered the house saying, Zahabtu lid dunya fa'uttu bil akhirah. Ya Ali, I have good news. I went for the sake of the dunya, but I came back with capital for the akhirah. What did Amir al muminin respond? He said to her, this is indeed a good day, Ya Umm al hasanain That we have a dua that the Holy Prophet taught us. Fatima to Zahra experienced a life of extreme difficulty. Salman al muhammadi describes her in more than one hadith. He says that I entered only to see that Fatima had a child in her lap and she was milling the wheat with one hand while trying to cook in a pot with the other hand. Imagine a tiny hut, a small home with four children. Nowadays, we can't even imagine our lives without our washing machines. We can't imagine our lives without a refrigerator. We can't imagine our lives without even one of these appliances. Imagine the life of Fatima to Zahra. This is how she lived. And yet, Salman says that all I could hear Fatima say, was Alhamdulillah ala alaih wa shukru lahu ala na'ma'ih. Even when she began the Fadakiyah sermon, this is how she began a sermon that is a condemnation of the greatest injustices against Fatima. A sermon that is supposed to be filled with anger, filled with despair and hopelessness. How does she begin it? 
الحمد لله على ما أنعم وله الشكر على ما ألهم والثناء بما قدم من عموم نعم ابتدأها وسبوغ آلاء أسداها وتمام منن والاها جمع عن الإحصاء عددها ونا عن الجزاء أمدها وتفاوت عن الإدراك أبدها واستحمد إلى الخلائق بإجزالها she goes on and on and on and on about what God's blessings about the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thanking him for his blessings. Fatimah al-Zahra is the epitome and the inspiration and the source of hope because even in the bleakest moments of her life, the short life in which she experienced miseries like none other, Fatimah was still filled with gratitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Finally, one of the ways with which Fatima maintained hope and became an inspiration for all of us is by caring for others. And I'll finish with this. I have seen my brothers and sisters, here's a practical lesson for all of us, that people involved in acts of charity, individuals who devote their time and energy to look after the weak, to look after the poor, to help orphans, as these wonderful brothers, the organizers of this program, may Allah bless them and protect them and support them in this cause and in this endeavor. An initiative that has been launched with the remembrance of Fatima to Zahra. You know this is going to be blessed, inshallah, because it's been linked and associated with the blessed name of Fatima and the remembrance of her tragedy. People who are involved in this kind of work are usually the happiest of people. When you see the misery that others are going through, you feel grateful. You feel thankful. You keep thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for His blessings for you, number one. Number two, there is no greater pleasure among the material pleasures of this life than to see a smile on the face of someone you have just helped. The happiness they feel. Why do you think these billionaires have charitable endeavors? Why do you think they give money? Mostly as a form of tax evasion. We know that. Also, it's for fame. But also because they enjoy seeing others benefiting. In other words, they're doing it for themselves. They're not really doing it for God. They're doing it because they feel satisfaction in knowing that they've helped somebody. And so helping others try and allocate a portion of your time, your effort to help other people, those who are less fortunate, those who are suffering. Fatima to Zahra was the symbol of helping others in every conceivable way. I could go on and on with examples and citations from her life as to how she did that over and over again, looking to help the poor, praying for others. The famous hadith where she was praying all night long until it was Fajr time. Her son Imam al Hassan alayhi salam said to her, Ya Ummah, why don't you pray for us as well? I've seen, I'm, I've been seeing you praying for the neighbors. Yes, the same neighbors who watched on as the ambush against the house of Fatima took place, as they set fire to the door of Rasulullah, those same neighbors who simply looked on like passive spectators, Fatima to Zahra would pray for them. And so Imam al Hassan said to her, Why don't you pray for us as well? She made this famous declaration Bunay, my son, Al Jar, Thumma Dar. Neighbors come before your own household. This was Fatima to Zahra. I will mention the very last thing that Fatima said to her, which goes to prove this point of mine. Allahu Akbar. She said to Asma bint Umayyis, Ya Asma, today I want to do something different. For the last 90 days, since the ambush on her home, Fatima has been bedridden. 
Fatima's ribs are broken. Fatima didn't experience a miscarriage, ya mu'mineen, ya muslimin. A miscarriage is when a mother loses her child in the early months of the pregnancy. But Fatima to Zahra had carried Al Muhsin ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib to term. Al Muhsin was about to be born. Fatima to Zahra experienced a stillborn, which is something that if you ask any doctor, if you ask any gynecologist, they'll tell you that the toll this takes on an individual is multiple times more than a childbirth, than a normal delivery. I'll give you one example. When a fruit is, not, is ripe, a fruit that's ripe, if you just so much as touch it, it falls into your hand, right? But when the fruit is not yet ready, when it's not ripe, for you to pluck it means you'd have to break the branch. This is what Fatima to Zahra, bi abi hi wa ummi experienced. All this time, Fatima, she couldn't really even attend to the children. But today was different. Today, Fatima actually managed to get up despite her pain. Fatima bathed her children. She combed their hair. She had them wear clean clothes. When Asma said, it looks like, Ya Binta Rasulullah, it looks like you've regained your strength. Alhamdulillah, you're feeling much better today, I'm sure. She said, Ya Asma, no, that's not the reason. It's because I'm about to meet my father, Rasulullah. And so I wanted to leave having looked after my children, knowing what will happen to my children after me. Fatima wants to show them some kindness and compassion, some motherly love before she leaves this world. Then Fatima said to Asma that I am going to go into my room. I have some munajat, Allahu Akbar. I have things to say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't disturb me. Don't let my children come. She went into that room. Listen to this. Fatima to Zahra began to make a prayer. She said, Ilahi, O oh Allah, Bihaqi an Nabi al Mustafa wa shawqihi ilayhi. Listen to these words. I ask you in the name of Abil Fadl al Abbas to ponder on what Fatima is saying here. She says, Oh Allah, I ask you in honor of your messenger, my father Muhammad al Mustafa, and in his eagerness to meet me. Look at this qasam. And I ask you, بِعَلِيٍّ الْمُرْتَضَى وَحُزْنِهِ عَلَيْهِ In honor of Ali ibn Abi Talib and his grief over his beloved wife Fatima. Oh Allah, I ask you, in honor of my son Hassan وَبُكَائِهِ عَلَيْهِ I ask you, in honor of Hassan and his cries over me. Why does Fatima say this? Because she saw Imam al Hassan cry when she fell in the middle of the alleyway after she was slapped by the tyrant. She has seen Hassan crying for her. Imam al Hassan is older, he knows what, his mother, what happened to his mother Fatima. O oh Allah, I ask you in honor of Al Hussein al Shaheed wa Ka'abatihi alayhi. I ask you in my son Hussein who will be martyred and his depression over me. Finally, she says, and this is the most painful, O oh Allah, I ask you bihaq al Fatimiyat. In honor of my two little girls, Zainab and Umm Kulthum. وَحَسْرَتِهِمْ عَلَيْهِ Hasra means yearning. Hasra means when Zainab and Umm Kulthum walked in, they saw the body of their mother Fatima to Zahra lying still. 
What a young girl, only two or three years old. What does she experience? How does she feel? I ask you in the name of that eagerness of my two daughters, O oh, Fatima to Zahra, what are you asking? All of these qasamat, what are you asking from Allah? She says the following, and taghfira li shi'ati Ali ibn Abi Talib that you forgive the sinners among the followers of my husband Ali even at that last moment Fatima to Zahra is praying for me and you Fatima is praying for the Shia Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein entered the house they asked Asma bint Umayyis, ya Asma, ayna ummuna Fatima? Where is our mother? We want to see our mother. Asma said that she is sleeping in her room. Imam al Hassan said, but this is not a time that our mother usually goes to bed. Something is wrong. They wanted to go into the room. Asma tried to stop them, but they wouldn't have it. They entered the room only to see that their mother had already died and left this world. Aywa Fatima. Fatima never got to say goodbye to her children. Imam al Hassan went to her head. Imam al Hussein grabbed her feet. Oh, Fatima, kalimini. Oh, mother, speak to me, answer me. Imam al Hassan and Hussein didn't know what to do. They ran outside. They went into the masjid where Amir al Mu'mineen was. When they came in, Amir al Mu'mineen knew something was wrong. He said, How is your mother? They said, Awalis qadmatat ummuna Fatima. Oh, Father, our mother is dead. They say Amir al Mu'mineen fell to the ground. Ya Abu al Hassan, Ya Ali ibn Abi Talib, you are the one that plucked open the gates of Khaybar and now your own feet can't hold you. Amir al Mu'mineen took his turban and threw it to the ground. They say that from the masjid where he was back to his home, it's a short distance, but the Imam sat on the ground multiple times. He went inside, Ya Umm al Hassan wal Hussein. Fatima al Zahra wouldn't answer, Ya bint Rasulullah. Fatima wouldn't answer, Amir al Mu'mineen burst into tears. He said, Ya Fatima, when Rasulullah died, I had you to console me and comfort me. Now my two pillars have broken. I say, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, on this day, your two pillars were broken. You had no one to turn you. But I wish you were there on the day of Ashura. When Aba Abdullah al Hussein, your own son, came after his brother Abbas on his way to where Abbas was lying on the ground, he first saw his severed hands. He then approached his brother. He saw an arrow planted in his eye. Al-an in kasara dhahri. My back is now broken, ya Abbas. Waqallat hilati. I now have no reason to fight anymore. One more thing, and my enemy is rejoicing because they all surrounded him, began clapping and laughing. Laqad qatalna al-Abbas. 